Okay, that's it. Now yeah. recording. Yeah. And I do a new share, and we do share this one, and then we do like this. Great. And now we're. Mm -hmm. you can do you want these? That's okay. It's it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. We we'll use this All one. Right. So that's the. So is the. Um, where's the microphone? You're just speaking. Hold mm -hmm. on. Without mic. Okay, so is that one? There's no mic. But, um, the, the, well, the mic's in here. And catch okay, you, so there's it's, no, there's no all right. So you're using the mic in the Mac. Yeah. 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 I see. Okay. All right. Well, we will we will start a couple of minutes uh, delayed. Sorry about that. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Pierre Espen Stokness, who requires a long introduction because he's a man who has done many things. Um, he's a psychologist, but he's also an economist, an ecological economist, perhaps. Um, the director of the Center for Green Growth at the Norwegian Business School in Oslo. He has, uh, he is also a, a member of the Green Party and uh, has been part of a startup uh, or, or st a co-founder of uh, a clean tech company called Gus Plus. Gus Plus. Gus Plus. Right. Mm. And um, perhaps more significantly in a sense than all of that, he's an academic who has given a talk that when I last checked had been viewed more than 3 million times in the last three years. So that's a bigger audience than most. <laughs> um, without getting in the way of you and uh, Pierre Espen, I give you the floor. We have people on Zoom with us as well. And um, you have 20 minutes to you start with the um, point of departure in redefining green growth within planetary boundaries, but you've already given a talk on your new book today in Stavanger on uh, Grand Vext or green growth. Mm. So uh, you're free to blend those and then we will continue with uh, with discussions afterwards. Yes, so thank you so much for inviting me and having me and uh, looking forward to the discussion. So 20 minutes is a quick, yeah, quick introduction and maybe I should stand here, yeah? I like, I hate to be uh, behind these kind of things, but uh, for the Zoom people, I will. So, uh, hello everyone. Um, I actually wrote this book in English and uh, it's been um, uh, accepted at the MIT Press. So it's called Tomorrow's Economy in English. And, uh, but they don't, didn't want to put it out in the US market this autumn. God knows why. Uh, so hopefully it will be a better uh, time for books and discussions when that election is over. So, um, in Norwegian, it was uh, translated into Norwegian, but it was a pretty good translation. I've, I controlled it myself. And uh, for those of you who read that kind of cryptic uh, code, uh, it's only 5 million people that do, but uh, it's there for those. Now, um, the, um, the overarching big question is, of course, uh, can we have eternal growth on a limited planet? And uh, for many people, that's, uh, of course, impossible. I think uh, David Attenborough has put it best. He said, uh, those who believe that we can have eternal growth on a limited planet must be either a madman or an economist. All right. But uh, I'm both a madman and an economist. So uh, it really depends on how you define and understand the words um, eternal growth, particularly growth, growth in what? and uh, how you understand the limits of the planet. So I'll try to do some quick um, views on that, and then we'll see where the discussion takes us. How long time did we have all together, Siddharth? For an hour. Okay, the 20 minutes and the 40 minutes discussion. Oh, cool. So let me do very rapidly then, um, an analysis and a suggestion for a solution and the discussion of whether it's credible also boils down to whether it's profitable. And finally, um, pulling it together in terms of um, the systemic change needed. So it's a rapid green growth at all possible within the system we have. Let's just dip into the first one. Um, in the Green Party and in the Green Environmental Movement, uh, it's quite common to Put the blame, so to speak, on the consumer. We are consuming too much. We're consuming the earth. Um, the left tends to put the blame on capitalism, its greed and uh, endless profits, and the capitalists that are killing the planet, while the right uh, prefer to aim, take aim at uh, government. Government is bloated, uh, it's, uh, it's ineffective, 
uh, it doesn't put the right uh, conditions in place. So the problem is the government or the problem is the capitalism or the problem is the consumers. But I think that's the wrong problem definition. So my starting point is to analyze the economy from the 1900s in terms of um, material flows and look at the potential for innovation with a radical resource productivity. What is um, obviously clear is that um, Attenborough is completely right if with uh, eternal growth you mean eternal grey growth. The grey growth, um, I mean this type of development, so this are in the material flow accounting, they're now using the four main categories of biomass, metals, the grey one, fossils, the orange one, and the yellow is the minerals, mainly the concrete and the cement industry, but also other typical building materials. Um, and of course, if you go back to 1970, uh, we had about 24 billion tons of material throughput in the economy. Uh, the GDP was on the right axis here, uh, almost 20 billion, sorry, 20 trillion uh, US $2,005. And as the decades have progressed, what we see is a perfect correlation, so to speak, between material throughput and the GDP increase. So the, the root of thumb is that in order to make one dollar of value added, the, the economy uses one kilogram of stuff, physical stuff. And it's been consistent over the last 50 years, so to speak. So what's new now? One of the things that are new now is that we're getting much better um, climate accounting and material accounting than we used to have. So for instance, this is a pretty new overview article from um, using the MFA, material flow analysis for the EU. And uh, if you look at the, the material metabolism, um, about six billion tons, sorry, yeah, six gigatons um, are domestically extracted each year, and 1.5 is imported each year to EU. So the processed materials, the domestic um, material consumption, so to speak, is seven and a half. Most of that is either burnt or it goes into landfill after one or zero uses. A lot goes into stocks. Um, from the stocks, meaning buildings, machines, factories, etc., uh, about a billion tons a year are taken from run down, torn down buildings, and 0 0.7 of the materials are used to create value more than once. Meaning that 90% of all the materials the economy is processing every year ends up as uh, trash or pollution after one or zero times use. If we break that down per European, we are about 500 million Europeans. Um, so taking the 7.4 gigatons divided by 500 million gives you 14 tons of material per person per year. If you divide that by 365, you get 40 kilograms per person per day. So for you, for you, 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 and for me, we're using 40 kilograms of stuff today before we get to bed. Or that, not we, but the economies. So anybody here has carried a backpack with 40 kilograms? Now that's heavy. We do that every day, but it's invisible. 90% of that goes to landfill and air after this first time use. And um, only 10%, as I said, is recycled. And of this is 28% biomass, 9% energy, 17% metals and 45% uh, minerals. And if you dip into those value chains that are responsible for this massive flows, then you find three value chains, particularly mobility, food, and buildings. They account for, in the European economy, 46% of employees, half the GDP, and 62% of household expense. And as I said, 90% 90, 90 of that is lost after first or zero times used. But even worse, the 10% we recover, they are typically polluted, mixed, and the value is halved. So 95% of the value of each material is lost after its first or zero use. So then the question becomes, is this the only way we can run the economy? Are we going to repeat this in the 2000s? Or do we have other options? So just to have a look at the way, where is that wastefulness? Um, if we look at a Volvo XC90, for instance, or a BMW, BMW X5 or something like that, and you pour 60 liters of fuel 
diesel or gasoline into it, where does it go? Most of it ends up as heating up the air, heating the engine, or it's idling, or uh, you lose it in the transmission, you lose it in the fan, you lose it in the tires because you have to overcome rolling resistance, you push aside air and you accelerate one and a half or two tons of steel. And then this little red dot there, that's what is used to moving me or you around. So it's a 99% waste of energy each time we use one of those modern um, wonders. Uh, so if I put 60 liters on this, this car, only 0.6, half a liter is used to something useful. The rest is pure destruction. Can we do better? Yes, of course we can. Is food any better? Well, I guess most of you know that we throw away a third of the food either in the chain or in the cuts to consumer. But even worse than that, um, even the 69% we consume is typically grown with a lot of fertilizer use. And most of that fertilizer ends up uh, as um, either runoff or evaporation as a, um, a nitrous oxide, so a very powerful greenhouse gas. Some of it is used to grow the, the stalk or the leaves. Some of it is lost on the field. Some of it goes straight through my, my, my digestion. And only 5% of the fertilizer actually applied to the fields end up in nourishing people. And worse, of those 5%, after having thrown away two, one third, 50% of the Europeans are overweight. So we use endless resources to make people unwell in our food system. Crazy. I could do the same thing with buildings, but since we have 20 minutes, I'll be quicker. So the solution then is a change of innovation and a change in the direction of investments. Um, I won't do the long version on the history of innovation, but most of you know, for instance, from Schumpeter that we've gone through a number of innovation waves, starting with mechanization, then the rail, then the mass production paradigm with Henry Ford and the cars, and then the transistors with the aviation and computers, and finally the internet wave, internet and communication technologies. Um, and of course, each time you have a wave, you change the value creation of the logic of the economy. So you get new winners that ride a surf each of these waves. And the idea with what we call this, the green shift is a fundamental change in the, the logic of value creation. So I'm expecting and we're seeing now the start of a sixth wave, which will be focusing on resource productivity, running on renewables and with circular material flows. But each time we are in the front of these waves, they seem unlikely. Anybody could remember, any of you are old enough to remember how you'd find somebody in a city without having a smartphone in the old days? And for your, those of you who'd be born after the internet, I'll tell you, it was possible, but you had to do it differently, right? And, and, and if, we'd, if we'd go back to the early 90s, I would say, you know, um, we would have um, extreme computing power in your pocket, uh, it will take care of all your kind of information and abilities. It would have been incredible. We wouldn't, wouldn't have believed it. Now I can have all the knowledge in the world accessible in my pocket out of thin air at any time. People just would not have believed it. So for each of these waves, uh, we, we hit the, some psychological barriers as to what we're able to imagine. And the main point in this short introduction is that with the first five waves, we spent all the economic energy, the investments, the, the brain power to increase labor productivity. So one person could do 200 people's work in one day after the mechanization, right? And one rail um, um, conductor, help me somebody, huh? Conductor, conductor maybe, yeah. <laughs> well, one people operating the train could, do two, could move 200 uh, horse carriages of cargo in one day without a single horse, which was completely unimaginable. So we've seen um, a factor 200 improvement in labor productivity. And I think what we are up against now in this, this next wave is that in 20, 30 years, we'll be able to do 10 to 50 to 100 times as much um, value creation 
from the same resource use. So from one kilowatt hour or one piece of timber or one barrel of oil, we'll be able to make 50 to 100 times more of value. So this is the shift from labor productivity to resource productivity, radical resource productivity. Now this is what then underlies the definition of green growth, where we invest each year in enough of those type of economic activities that give a lower total environmental impact. So we would have increased value added with reduced material use in those activities. And it's all about the, how much this is opened up, how much you're able to decouple that every year. And um, the gray growth is a productivity increase with total environmental impact grows in spite of higher efficiency. So you have value added going up. Let's say you're making a 10% better um, combustion engine, but then you're driving it 15% more, which means that the, the growth will be eating up the efficiency gains. So that's the Jevons paradox for those of you interested in the, the economic history of this. So we have a resource productivity, which is higher than the rate of growth. Now we can define green growth mathematically. Well, in a gray growth, the resource productivity is lower than the rate of growth. Quite simple, but politicians either don't understand or they didn't want to understand. So they keep greenwashing, which is to label a gray growth as green. Because it's a little bit greener. We don't use as much as we did per unit before, but still resource consumption is not going quickly enough down. So let's do quick three examples. How do we solve the, the, the resource wastefulness and how can we improve the resource productivity? Well, in mobility, if we go back to this car and this wastefulness, that means to get from A to B, 10 kilometers, I would typically use seven thermal kilowatt hours. Well, if I use an electric bike or I go on an electric bus, or if there is no bikes or no buses using the same type of size of machinery, it only go, it says uses the end user uh, energy use by 72%. So by configuring smart mobility systems based on these, we could easily achieve 90% reduction in the energy use uh, in mobility. Second, food. Anybody of you go to McDonald's? <laughs> You're not that kind of people, are you? Well, I have to confess, I do, but I did, that's better. Uh, because I had two boys and they really, really, really wanted a McDonald's, a Big Mac sometimes. So, but now they are, luckily they're big enough, so I don't have to go there anymore. I would rather go to um, Funky Fresh Foods where I can get, get a Big Buck burger rather than a Big Mac burger. And the point is, if I um, consume this 500 calories, uh, 10,000 calories will have been used to make this one. While if I eat a big buck burger from buckwheat and other plant-based ingredients, typically um, I would only use 1,000 calories from the harvest and emit 0 0.2 kilograms of CO2 to get the same amount of calories that is in this. In addition, uh, I get healthier as uh, processed meats are known to be carcinogenic. So it's a clear example of how we, if we continue with this kind of growth, it kills the planet. But if we grow in this way, then we can continue. One trick question here is, this one is usually a bit more expensive than this one. So this is, let's say this is 60 kroner and this is 100 kroner. If I manage to go past McDonald's, like and I get to funky fresh foods, then I have to buy more. One of it, I have to pay more for, for getting one of this. Um, in choosing this over that one, have I now, have I now increased my consumption? Or have I reduced my consumption? I'm paying more, 100 kroner. Have my consumption got up or got down? Yeah. So my contribution to value creation would go up, but my resource consumption would go down. So my money consumption goes up, my resource consumption goes down. And this is a big problem in our communications because people tend to associate growth or consumption with one thing. Because over the last 50 years, we've been conditioned to believe that they are always in sync, that they are one-to-one. -one. And that's both a mental barrier and a, um, um, 
Well, I'll, I'll leave that point to another time. Okay. Um, so this is the reason, of course, many of you know, this is um, concentrates, this is hay and silo, this is uh, pasture. And uh, when we push all that energy through the animals, we end up with losing at least 93%, sorry, 97% uh, of, the, of the harvest uh, in making one of those. So um, one of the studies that went into the IPCC 1.5 degree special report, I don't know if that's something that people are reading here, but uh, this came out in 2018. Um, this is a scenario based on um, um, from some analysis at the EEASA, um, an Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. And they identified 21 potentially disruptive consumer innovations which if you scale these in, in a rapid kind of S-curve type of, of, of diffusion, the innovation diffusion, um, this would reduce the energy need at the consumer side to a much lower level than it is today by 2050. So if you believe that any or most of these can become the new normal, that could contribute to putting on us on the pathway to achieving the 1.5 degree target. So it's the first of those four scenarios that can be found in IPCC 1.5. Have a look at it. It's called LED, low energy demand scenario. Now, is it, is it credible that we'd be able to do this shit? Or is it always the case that greener is more expensive? So, Sustainable solutions are not profitable, they are more expensive than conventional. This is a very also another traditional perception. Green is kind and nice and idealistic, but the real profits, mm -mm. that used to be the case. But um, recently, a number of studies have been looking into this. For instance, um, if you look at the most sustainable companies in the world, according to expert opinion, these are companies such as Unilever, Patagonia, Interface, and IKEA is coming up. And then you look at their profitability relative to, for instance, the World Stock Index, as shown by Morgan Stanley. Then you get this picture that the sustainable companies such as Interface, Unilever, beat the market consistently. Now, this is just a couple of companies. That's a, maybe anecdotal evidence. So this question of, are sustainable companies more profitable than the conventional ones? Or to put it differently, is it profitable to be green? Now, more than 2,200 studies have been looking into this issue over the last decades. And of course, as researchers, if we can't deal with that many studies, we make reviews. So 50 reviews articles have been made. And then when you have 50 reviews, what do you do then? You make a meta review. So a meta review was, was published a few years ago now uh, on the 2,000 studies based on 50 reviews. And what they find was that 63% of them are positive. So having a sustainable company that is more resource productive also pays off in corporate financial performance. 8% of them say it's negative. So if you want to find a study, you, you would. 8% of 2,000 are quite a few. Uh, and uh, some people do that. Um, I prefer to, to stand there. Uh, the rest between, um, let's say, 63 and 8 that makes us uh, 71. So the 29% of the other studies said it really depends on how you weight the different dimensions of sustainability. So no clear answer. If you have a high social performance, then maybe not. If you have a high green performance, then maybe yes. But depending on, how, on the weight. But in conclusion, 90% of the studies show a non-negative so-called ESG to corporate financial performance relationship. And it took quite a while for the financial community to absorb this news. Um, but now, investors all over the world are waking up to it. 
So for instance, Nordea did this analysis last year. They took, um, based on Morton, Morgan Stanley's um, uh, ESG ratings, You know, all the, the credit agencies, they are using these grades to, to rate companies on their credit. So if you have a very solid, strong balance with a strong cash flow, you will get an AAA. If you have a weak balance, you may get BB or BB or CCC. So this is a system that all investors know very well. And the funny thing is now that Morgan Stanley is doing the same thing on sustainability, by giving each company a rating that the investor community is understanding in terms of the same grades, but now how well they're doing on their ESG performance. And just to get, make, sure, make sure everybody's on board, environment, social governance, right? These are the extra financial dimensions that companies now are required to report on. And what you can see here is that if you put your money in 2012 in those companies that had an AAA ESG rating, not the credit rating, then an ESG rating, then you would have a 50% higher profitability than if you put that same money in a B or a CCC rated company. And this is quite new. I mean, we didn't have this eight to 10 years ago, whatever, uh, this consistent higher profitability of the ESG productive companies. And that's the reason why we're seeing these surges on the stock exchange right now, why everybody's running off the green or ESG shares, as they call it. So I find this a very exciting time to be speaking about green growth. Um, you know, I tried to write this book completed uh, three, two or three years ago, but then the Green Party called me to say if I would willing to stand for parliament. So I had to put this whole thing aside. And now I took it up after I was let out of the parliament. And maybe I had a big stroke of luck because it's selling like hell. Uh, the first uh, print is already sold out. Uh, and I never thought a typical economic book about something boring as green growth would ever <laughs> because I wrote it for my students, not for, you know, road sale. But this, I think this is the reason. And in a crisis like we had now with COVID, what it says here is that 92% of the ESG stocks have been, or ESG funds have been outperforming conventional funds. So even in a downturn, it's much better to have ESG performance up. And the biggest investor in the world, BlackRock, you may be following this stuff, I don't know. Investors are increasingly recognizing that climate risk is an investment risk. So if you cannot do a proper climate um, uh, accounting with a proper climate risk analysis and uh, proper pricing of the climate risks, then they, they pull their money out. And that's what we're seeing in oil and coal and probably also gas a little bit further down. All right, I think I used my 20 minutes. We stop there. Um, I have, of course, endless more stuff, but um, Let's do the, my conclusions and then we see where we go from there. So, um, problem is really uh, an amazing resource wastefulness that we didn't really think much about in the 1900s. Major problem with conventional economics seen from an ecological economics point of view is that there is no accounting for material flows. Material flows are seen only through the lens of price, not through the lens of material throughput. So conventional economics lacks the foundation of being able to do proper material flow accounting. Economists just can't do that because they've been blind to it, at least since Robert Solov's growth theory in uh, 1956. So we need a new type of productivity. When I speak about resource productivity, most economists go, We've done that, but no, not really, you haven't. You've been working on the one word of productivity and with productivity, you usually mean labor productivity. So, and uh, third, um, it seems increasingly that green is a new black and this will be a driver that would drive the sixth wave. And um, companies are increasingly required to improve their ESG performance and also their ESG accounting. So with that, uh, I will stop and we'll see where the discussion takes us. Yeah? Are you more comfortable speaking from where you are? Are you happy to go up there for the sake of a handful of people on Zoom? 
and the people on Zoom can also do uh, chat. Yeah. Huh? You can, and they can unmute themselves and speak. So. Oh, they can speak as well. Okay. <laughs> but usually that ends up with feedback. But maybe it, it works here. Work. Okay, cool. Let's try it. No, nobody? Was everything clear or is it just confusing? Everything's super clear. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you. Perfect. <laughs> super clear. Okay. Yes. Okay, do you first? No. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you for asking for a wonderful uh, talk. I just want to go back to 2008 at the University of Ghana. We had Sir Antoine Baita. Yeah. And he was, of course, stood behind the back of four and back of ten and wrote a lot about the same good resources for the city and so on. Mm. Uh, and he wrote together with Owens and Owens and so on. And he got the question in 2008 uh, why is resource efficiency? Uh, not taking place. Uh, and he had one explanation that was some discrepancy between his perspective and Robin's uh, that they didn't take into account the state and regulations and stuff like that. Um, so do you think there's a major change now? Mm. Because I, I think what you show is that what was the perspective in the 90s and early 20s actually now is moving. Yes, I very much agree with that analysis. Um, I had a debate with Carl Wall the other day, if you know him, yeah, and, yeah. and uh, he pulls out, so what else is new, Stockness? <laughs> I mean, we've heard this from Weizsäcker since the 1990s. Yeah. Um, so we have been speaking about green growth for many years. Why hasn't happened? And um, I'd like to propose, um, I, I completely agree with both Carly and you in the crit criticism that we've heard about radical resource efficiency before, but who are we? Uh, certainly not the politicians and certainly not the CEOs much. It's been a, a kind of very narrow debate in some certain ecological, economics or sustainability advocate circles. It, even um, when politicians have been speaking about green growth, then it's been mainly what we call greenwashing or, um, or green BS uh, rather than actually implementing the requirements, which is also what you said, Weizsäcker can mention that. They really haven't implemented the regulations that would enhance the broad rollout of, of um, resource productivity. So let me give you seven things that are new now that we didn't have 10 years ago, okay? First, the Paris Agreement combined with the SDGs, both those things happened in 2015. In the beginning, I was pretty um, skeptical to the SDGs because I imagined they would work more or less the same as the MDGs, the, the Millennium Development Goals. But SDGs have kind of caught up, caught on in um, strategy circles in a much deeper way than the MDGs did. So now we are seeing that the SDGs become a common framework for ESG accounting. So from the SDGs, Companies are now deducing which SDGs do we want to give materiality to in our accounting. And this is new. Also, the Paris Agreement, I mean, the INDCs are, of course, clearly inadequate. Um, the, it's, a, it's a voluntary agreement with no tooth, no teeth in them. But it has changed the conversation in a deep way. So those two things uh, from a global level um, are starting to kind of, shall we say, seep into uh, governmental structures, particularly in the EU, but also uh, across the world in a much deeper way than the MDGs ever did. I think the SDGs set a, um, a common clear picture of the future we want, which is also the title of uh, Cristiana Figueres, the last book, uh, The Future uh, We Want. Um, so that's one. Second, price of renewables and the price of resource productivity solutions that ride on the digital wave. So we I can illustrate those with, let's say, this one here, mobility as a service, or the peer-to-peer -peer business models, the peer-to-peer -peer electricity um, 
smart grid. We didn't have those things in the 1990s, not in the 2000s either. So the technology and the pricing, but particularly the effect of the low, um, the low end, the other end of the huge fifth digitalization wave uh, opens up new commercial and new technological opportunities or opportunity space that we simply didn't have 10 years ago. So that's number two. Number three, building on the Paris Agreement, the investor community starts to take action. I don't know how many of you are well versed in the soup of acronyms such as TCFD, Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, which was headed by head of Bank of England, Carney, together with Bloomberg. And when these guys start to speak about these things, the rest of the finance community starts to take notice, which they didn't do in the 2000s. So now, as I said briefly, if you don't have a proper climate risk analysis, then investors are pulling their money out and your stock is going down. Now, CEOs tend to take notice then. They don't care about what the sustainability guys and geeks are saying, but when the money goes out and they don't, they get their, the cost of capital increases, and we're talking. Four, um, climate accounting and material flow analysis. Um, CDP.net, if you know Carbon Disclosure Project, it's a voluntary um, reporting system, CDP. Um, they are now delivering a uniform system for climate reporting that makes it possible to compare between companies and between sectors. And part of the TCFD package is that they require um, them to follow the CDP structure. Even Walmart, one of the biggest bad guys on the block, are now requiring their 100,000 suppliers to report on CDP. And um, yeah, I, no, I won't digress more on that. So while in the old days you would say you would put the blame on insufficient PIGUI and taxes, so the, the government hasn't put sufficient regulations in place now, it's kind of coming in, in another, from another way, a more, more bottom-up way. Fifth, um, one of the points I touched, touched upon, this is mostly applied for the last two years, that um, for 20 years we had something called corporate social responsibility, CSR. Yeah? And hopefully people were putting out a sustainability report in addition to the financial report. That was, if you were an investor, here's the sustainability report and here's the annual report, I would go, they didn't care all, but now with the ESG reporting, they are taking care and they are putting it into the big data systems and they are starting to model in uh, different kind of risk factors. And this is not just uh, the nice guys. This is people like, like again, Morgan Stanley, of course, they're doing it themselves, but also um, uh, most of the big banks, uh, Bank of America, uh, Deutsche Bank, all of these people are, are now building ESG analysis into the financial analysis. It's happening as we speak. Six, EU. What's happened in EU is that the stuff that Lovins and Weizsäcker was speaking about in the 1990s is now becoming policy and we have Ursula von der Leyen speaking about that from not just the European Commission but also in the middle of the European Parliament. So it's taken like 25 years for those ideas to, to creep in to the minds of the politicians. But we never heard those kind of things from the EU. Uh, that kind of depth. I, mean, I think people like uh, David Cameron, um, I think even Tony Blair was speaking about green growth at some point in 2000 and a few others, but they didn't mean much with it uh, and there was no follow-up. And now if you look at the circular economy action package of the EU, the list of actions being taken there is mind-blowing. Um, they're addressing plastics, they're addressing um, electric waste, they're addressing buildings, they're going to renovate a million houses in the EU. So, so um, there is now regulatory action of a completely uh, other scale than we saw previously. And finally, seventh, which pertains to this year only, COVID. 
after the financial crisis, um, there, was, there was speech about um, regulating and reining in the markets, but it didn't really happen much. But with the health dimension of COVID, uh, we now see um, for everybody who has eyes, uh, the need for an active state. So the idea of the neoliberal passive state that should keep its hands out of markets can never be more dead. Just look at the market for vaccinations. Who would, um, who would doubt that government are key procurement and, and market shapers when it comes to both the development, the testing, the security and the distribution of vaccinations? So it's, it's becoming more apparent than ever that um, government has a huge um, job in terms of shaping the markets, not just fixing market failures in a reactive way. Um, so um, those seven things um, make me very optimistic in terms of the 2020s. So I, maybe we should speak about the failed noughties and the um, uh, the, what you call it, the, the doubtful teens, but we, now we will have the raging 20s. And I will come back in 10 years and you can kill me if it didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I agree. I have the same hope. Yes. The change is, is, I think it's evident since 2015. Yeah. But I would say what has also happened is that climate change, the issue of climate change has pushed back into the resource discussion. Mm. So it comes in, because you have at times the resource scarcity and you're running out of resources like you need to go, which could kind of suppress that. Mm. And then you have instead the, the uh, kind of climate change which pushes back into and then puts out again the resource. Yeah, uh, and as I said, manifests in terms that investors understand as climate risk. Yeah. and the loss of share value if you don't address it yeah you have a, I don't know, I have a question yeah yeah so you touched upon this but could you elaborate on the relationship between the public sector and private companies when it comes to investing in the climate crisis and the role that they play in that mm. it's a big issue um and that's why i dedicated a full one third of my book uh <laughs> the last third it, to to address it um what can I say briefly? In the book, I, I show a model. I'll take you through it briefly. So let's say you are a CEO and you want to ride the wave and create shareholder value through being a part of the green shift. What can you do? For years and years, managers have been training on like three strategy tools. How many of you know what a SWOT is? S-W-O-T, SWOT, yeah? It's one of the major strategy tools. They use that. The second tool is Michael Porter's Five Forces. All the MBAs are drilled in that, maybe not at university. And a third is the Boston Consulting Group Matrix. Milk the cow and kick the dog. Look out of stars, no? Yeah, so these kind of ways have been to develop a strategy. This is another tool that um, Based on others, of course, we all, in academia, we all copy each other, don't we? But we put a little bit extra on each time. Hope that's no, enough novelty. So building on a Gareth Kane, a green executive, and a few others, uh, I propose this model. So let's say you're a CEO or you're in a strategy team organization and you want to, to, to ride the waves. How can we realize resource productivity as a company? Then you have these six levels. First, you can do outreach. You can collaborate with others in R&D projects. You can go to the University of Stavanger and have great minds help you find out new standards or new technology, and which could then later be put to use. Or you could buy um, allowances from the European trade scheme, or you can um, simply give your employees time to help NGOs or pick up plastic on the beach, uh, when, you know, that kind of thing. This used to be called um, corporate uh, social responsibility or philanthropy. It's important, I, I'm not ridiculing it in any way, but the problem is people often stop there and then they call themselves green, right? And they haven't really touched the issue at all. Next level is house cleaning. This is where you get an ISO 14001 certification for your environment management system. You get a 
you, you clean your waste bins or you reduce your waste, you get a meat-free Monday in the cantina or the restaurant, you, you, you maybe put in place a climate accounting system, or you may put um, employees on the board, all those kind of nice, good things, which is very important. I'm not ridiculing those either, but I'm criticizing any company who stops the effect. I think the effect stops if you stop there. So third, greening supply. This is where the journey really begins. And when you require um, full LCA of all, anything you want to buy, you want to know how it's going to be reused before you buy it. You buy less stuff. You may buy services instead of stuff. And you buy, buy better quality stuff that has a longer duration. Yeah? So anything I buy should be scrutinized in terms of resource efficiency as a purchaser. If you stop there, we would even then have a major impact in the economy. You may know that the Norwegian government, they use 500 billion kroners each year, growing to 600 probably this year, billions. That's about 100,000 kroner per person. So imagine you have 100,000 kroner in your, in your um, shopping wallet, walking down to the city. That's the amount of money they're using every year. So if they just use that money in a consistently green way, we would have a greener economy in a few years. We've been speaking about this for many years, but it hasn't really been integrated, uh, uh, hasn't uh, had really been uh, implemented. Um, hopefully, it will very soon be better. We can discuss that. Green operations, this is when you start to do the kind of loving stuff where you um, do a full sy systems optimization rather than just incremental steps, innovations in how you deliver the goods or deliver the services. This is operations, how you configure those. Then what you sell, do you sell products and services? Can you face out the gray ones, the resource efficient ones and introduce new innovative ones based on circular uh, use of materials? So you do a cradle to cradle certification. So this is a classic step of uh, McDonough and Brown Garden for those who are in that field. Finally, you have the business model. So simple most simple uh, norwegian example is the 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 company called too good to go you make money out of eliminating food waste so the more food waste we eliminate the higher are your profits that's the kind of perfect green business model with a very high potential effect the minute you, you scale it so my answer to your question is that any company has the responsibility to walk up the stairs and in order to be compliant with the Paris Agreement or the climate crisis, they should at least deliver, uh, uh, they should have a more than 5% improvement in the resource productivity per year. That would make it possible to achieve the two degree target. If you want to aim for the 1.5 degree target, it should be 7% per year. So you can easily now calculate a so-called science-based target in terms of the relationship between your value added and your emissions. Anybody here who have been looking into science-based targets? No, we should Google it. It's very interesting. It's a very new, uh, lots of hundreds of companies are now signing up for science-based targets. And then this is of course the companies. So what about the politicians? What about regulation? That was your question, huh? Yeah. And In my book, I propose a new discourse around government because I find particularly Anglo-Saxon discourse um, a deeply embedded polarity between free markets versus government, where the government is seen as um, ineffective, bloated, and sometimes corrupt, sometimes at least bureaucratic. While the free market is supposed to be efficient, creative, and um, effective. So rather than having that old, somewhat neoliberal tinged flavor in your understanding of government, what we need to understand is that government uh, need to be both stimulating in the sense that they would stimulate the right kind of demand, for instance, by using their purchasing power, their procurement power, uh, but also entrepreneurial, 
Um, if you, any of you have, have touched upon a lady called Mariana Matsukato, she's writing a, beautifully about the need for entrepreneurial state, how markets are blind. Markets will easily go down the same route over and over again into path dependency and just keep doing cost cutting what they ever, what they ever did. So if you want a market that is within planetary boundaries, you need an entrepreneurial state coming with clear missions that would be helped to coordinate a whole suite of public instruments. So a clear mission statement from the state saying that, for instance, in Norway, we should have zero, um, we are going to discuss this tomorrow, I can't remember right now the exact formulation, but uh, all Norwegian animal feed, whether cows or salmon should be fully sustainable and by 2030 with zero, zero uh, soy from forest loss sensitive areas. That was the formulation we used, yeah? That doesn't happen by itself. The market will never do that. So you need a state to set, we are going to go there. And the minute that's credible, the entrepreneurial state is setting the direction of innovation, then the companies speed up and they shift their investments. So first, stimulating the demand in a green way, also by securing anybody who uh, becomes unemployed uh, a way back into work. So stimulating uh, consumer demand, stimulating business uh, demand. Second, an entrepreneurial state that sets clear missions that helps give directions to the innovation. And then thirdly, guardian. Uh, we need government to step up their role to guard critical ecosystems and services and areas. So um, I propose a new discourse around government um, as a stimulating entrepreneurial guardian. That's the new role of, of government. And I think that's easily as important as companies climbing the stairs. What you didn't ask about, of course, which may be the next question, what about individuals? But maybe there's another question or a comment. Yeah? Good. Along those lines. Uh, yes. Okay. First you and then they. Yeah? You. Do you think there's a better way of measuring uh, growth other than GDP when it comes to these type of things? I know GDP takes into account a lot of things that aren't necessarily good. As an economist, do you foresee us ever decoupling mm. growth from GDP? Mm. Uh, in case you don't, didn't hear it out there in Zoom, uh, do I see any better way of value, uh, measuring, did you say value creation or did, yeah. yeah, value creation than through the GDP? Um, yes, I do. And um, um, oh, it's not in this presentation. Uh, what I'm attempting in this book and in, in an English version to Morris economy is a reframing of the direction of growth. So um, we've had about 500 years of accounting practices, going back to Luca Pacioli in 1494 of double Italian credit debit accounting, right? And what you get out of that is um, um, profits, the, the value added as the sum contribution of all all expenses so all sales minus all expenses uh, external expenses so i think that's a still an important number but we could change the context around gdp rather than trying to reform gdp so my as my proposal is that we should speak about growth in resource productivity rather than growth in gdp and growth in resource productivity means value added divided by resource use. In this way, we are building the missing physical dimension of the economy, which is the resource use, into a single number that integrates both immaterial money with material resource use. So, and then in the book, I also propose something to do with, has to do with the social dimension, which is the rate of inclusive growth, where, which is the value added divided by the, uh, the, the change in inequality over the same period. And those two together, resource productivity, a sufficiently high resource productivity and a sufficiently high social productivity means we have a healthy growth. Because you've been trying for more than 30 years to redefine GDP, 
but we are, we are going very, very, uh, into very, very strong institutional barriers and systems in Ertia, which is we're trying to change an ancient 500 years accounting system. So thinking as a psychologist, I'm more trying to reframe that, put it inside another frame, rather than going into the, the nitty gritty and changing it from within. So that was a, one comment to that. Uh, hello, anybody in Zoom who wanted to say something? Oh yeah, I just had a quick question, if, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, can you hear me? I am hearing you, but I don't know about these guys because it's in, yes, if they hear you, go on. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm wondering, um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm in Canada right now and in, uh, in, in North America and the States and Canada, a lot of the conversations about green recovery or the Green New Deal is really uh, prefaced around uh, um, modern monetary theory so significant deficit spending uh, in order to facilitate that i'm wondering if you have any comments because you, you spoke a little bit about the role of the government but i see is that that's a really sort of significant um change in the role of uh, of government to oh is my I, i'm seeing my face am i like a big screen in the class right now yeah. <laughs> um yeah so <laughs> don't pick your nose it. It um yeah so, so okay will you finish what monetary theory? What, what are your thoughts? Oh, um, I think monetary reform is critical. And I think I see it going in two directions. Um, my first comment on that is even the European Central Bank is now considering a digital currency. Um, I don't know how much monetary theory you guys are into, but you know, most of the money we have isn't really money, it's credit. So it's created through a mortgage. So banks are creating money and they're creating it back to, uh, as a, as a, with a debt. Which creates a lot of problems for the economy. Um, today, I think only two to three percent of the money uh, is not created as credit. So the idea behind digital currency is that in the same way that in the early 1900s and the early 1970s, we would have a significant proportion of the money being created as um, non-interest bearing um, um, yeah, money, <laughs> real money made by the central bank. Now you could do the same thing uh, with digital currency. So the central banks could issue digital funds, digital money that is not created with a debt attached to it. If you could increase the amount of digital non-debt money in the system, then uh, it would probably reduce the fluctuations and the, a lot of the problems associated with very high debt uh, needed for growth in the economy. The other thing I would like to propose or mention that connection with one true theory is that as long as there is unemployment and unused resources in the economy, it makes fully sense to, uh, for the state to make more of that digital money and then give it to the poor. So rather than creating money by um, quantitative easing or issuing governmental bonds, which then a credit, a credit debit system, you would just create that money and give it to those who have the less. In this way, you would rather than introduce new money from the top, you would introduce new money from the bottom and it would create stimulation in the economy on the demand side and you could have a more healthy growth of, of both consumption and uh, in employment. Um, the problem with using the governmental bonds, the quantitative easing approach, is that you typically uh, make the money available only to the very rich or the capital owner, those who are already inside the financial system, and it doesn't always trickle out to those who really need it, which is typically the small and medium-sized enterprises, SMEs. So neither the poor nor the SMEs get access to that money which is introduced in a so-called stimulus when you put it into governmental bonds. But if you rather reverse that, make the money digital and just type that money into people's accounts, then because they are poor, they tend to spend most of it rather than just put it into real estate and other speculative uh, financial investments. And then you get a bottom up um, stimulus of uh, the markets. So they would go spend it on something they really need, uh, hopefully also education 
and uh, better, um, more resource productive services. So those are two things, introducing digital currency and then um, delivering that through universal basic income or some kind of stimulus directly to the, to the poor, which is of course what the US government has been doing now under the, under the cover of COVID. But rather than just being a kind of exceptional thing, it should become a standard way of introducing new funds into the economy. So when I spoke about the stimulating government, this is a key third way that the government could stimulate an economy. So those are a few reflections. I think we'll say, uh, say thank you. Yes. Thank you for a brilliant, I would say, lecture and uh, very impressive uh, reactions to the questions. And we're really happy to have you here. And we would like you to come back as soon as possible uh, to give another lecture. That's so, very kind of you, but you didn't know. But actually, I met Ernest 30 years ago, I think. But you were at SIM, wasn't that right? Okay. Yes, yeah, maybe. maybe. And then you had something, uh, I could tell you something like the age. Oh, really? Where I won. You won. Yes, yes. because my.